literary language is definitely different from our day to day language right and what makes it different is the use of figures of speech let's learn about these figures of speech that are commonly used in literature i have grouped them into small groups so that it will be convenient for you to understand the first category is all those figures of speech which come under comparison of two similar things here we have simile and metaphor a simile is the comparison of two similar things here you have to remember that a simile compares two things using the words like or as for example when i say anu is sweet like honey what are the things that are sweet anu is sweet honey is also sweet so they are two similar things and i am comparing them using the word like anu is sweet like honey so this is a simile and look at other examples he is as busy as a bee i run like the wind my love is like a red rose just like a simile metaphor is also a comparison between two similar things but what is different here in simile we had the words like or as in metaphor we don't use these words we compare two similar things without these words and it says that one thing is something else when i say she is like an angel that is a simile because i am using the word like but when i say she is an angel she is not like an angel she is an angel then that is a metaphor look at other examples time is money they are my shining stars no like no as in the next category we have figures of speech which uses contrast now here we have oxymoron paradox and antithesis oxymoron is a compressed paradox you will understand when we discuss paradox oxymoron contains two contradictory words there will be only two words in an oxymoron and both these words are the opposites of each other clear see reality show these are opposites reality is the opposite of show show is the opposite of reality loud silence original copy if something is original it couldn't be copy but we say original copy so oxymoron will contain two words and they would be the opposite of each other next we have paradox now paradox is an extended oxymoron later in the previous slide i told you oxymoron is a compressed paradox paradox is an extended oxymoron now just like oxymoron paradox also contains two contradictory ideas but in oxymoron we only had two words in paradox it contains more than two words a paradox is a statement that is self contradictory what is told in the statement is refuted in the same statement see for example less is more see it's a little difficult to understand and come to what the meaning actually is now next one a child is the father of a man how can the child be a father of a man there is a meaning in the sentence but it's difficult to grasp it in the first read death though shall die how would death die so such statements which are self contradictory are called paradoxes okay in paradox you have to remember that it is a little difficult to get the meaning out of the statement the statement could be a bit confusing because it is too contradictory okay you have to remember this so that you will understand the next figure of speech next up we have antithesis now antithesis is a literary device in which two opposite ideas are used in the same sentence just like paradox the same sentence in the same sentence we have two opposite ideas now how is antithesis different from paradox now i told you in paradox the meaning is a little difficult to extract it is a little abstract unclear it is as if the meaning is hidden in a paradox but in antithesis even though two contradictory ideas are used in the same sentence the meaning is not hidden you could actually read the sentence and easily understand what the meaning is unlike a paradox here are some examples 
It's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. This is from Paradise Closed. See, it is very simple. There are two contrasting ideas to rule somewhere and to serve somewhere. Hell and heaven. But still the meaning is very simple. Same way, patience is bitter but it has a sweet fruit. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. I have named the next category as repetition. And in this category we have alliteration, assonance and anaphora. The first one is alliteration. Now alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds in the beginning of two or more nearby words. What is repeated? Consonant sounds are repeated and they should be in the beginning of the words too. So this is alliteration. Coca-Cola sang sweetly, French fry. Assonance is also repetition of words. But what is different here is that vowel sounds are repeated and they don't have to be in the beginning of the words itself. It could be anywhere in the word. So repetition of vowel sounds in nearby words is called assonance. Example, try to light the fire. No pain, no gain. Next we have anaphora which is not repetition of sounds. Alliteration and assonance were repetition of sounds, either consonant sounds or vowel sounds. Here anaphora is the repetition of words or could be phrases too at the beginning of a number of sentences which are kept together. For example, in Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream, he keeps repeating this phrase, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and again he repeats, I have a dream. So, I have a dream is being repeated again and again. So, this is an example for anaphora. And in this sentence, stay safe, stay well, stay happy. So, stay, the whole word is being repeated. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Again, it was. It was, is being repeated. So as you can see, it's not just a sound that is repeated, not a vowel sound or consonant sound that is repeated. The entire word or a group of words is being repeated. And that is anaphora. Now, I have not mentioned something called refrain in this slide, but I will just mention it here since we are discussing about repetition of lines. Now, one thing you have to remember is this is all called anaphora only if what word is repeated comes at the beginning. So, beginning is important. Refrain is also repetition of words, but it could come wherever uh, the poet places to put the word. It doesn't matter whether it is in the first or at the end of the sentence. If it is repeated, it is refrain. If it is repeated, the words are repeated and at the beginning of the sentence, it is anaphora. In the next category, I have put all these figures of speech which represents or stands for something else. Here we have symbol, metonymy and synecdoche. We are all familiar with what a symbol is. A symbol is anything which signifies something else. See, when you are waving at someone with your hand, the other person understands that you are saying bye. So, waving your hand is a symbol of uh, telling the other person bye. So anything, if it stands for something else, then it is a symbol. Red color symbolizes danger. Dove shows peace. The road, in road no taken. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood. And that poem. So the road symbolizes the choices the poet could have taken. Now metonymy is when one term is used as a substitute for another word that is closely associated with it. Let's look at the example. He got the crown. Now only a king will get the crown. So instead of telling that this person has become the king, we are saying that he got the crown. So the word crown has been used as a substitute for the word king. Now, in the second example, the pen is mightier than the sword. Now, you can't take a pen through uh, a war and fight the soldiers and win with a pen when all the others are standing with a sword. Here, the word pen is representing words. So, words are more powerful than using any other aggressive force. Sword stands for any aggression or that kind of a physical force. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Ears here refer to your attention. Give me your attention. 
Now we have synecdoche which could be a little confusing. Let's see. Synecdoche is a term for a part of something used to refer to a whole or vice versa. Now here also we are not using the exact term for the thing. Instead we are using another word. But how is synecdoche and metonymy different? In metonymy we are using another word. We are using a substitute and these two words should be similar, somewhat similar. Only then we can uh, use it in place of the other word. That is what we told in metonymy. In synecdoche we are using another word as substitute. But here we are actually using a word which is somehow part of the whole thing. For example, I have four mouths to feed. Here mouth is the part of a person. Okay, a part of a person is used to talk about the entire person. So four mouths here means four people. He is put behind bars. Now bar is a term, uh, it's a part of a prison. Now that part, the name of the part is used to represent prison. Check out my new wheels. Wheels, they are part of vehicles, cars, buses, whatever it is. So wheels here refer to a vehicle. Okay, so metonymy is when you represent something else using a word that is similar to the other thing. Similar, that is all metonymy requires. In synecdoche, we are using another word to represent, but this word should be part of the whole. Okay, now moving on, we have a few more others which I have not categorized, but they are very easy. The first one is personification. Personification is giving human characteristics to an animal, thing or idea. We talk about something that is not living, something that is not human, as if it is a human. Then it is called personification. The meaning is there exactly in the word person, personification. See the examples. The trees danced in the wind. We know only humans dance. Trees don't dance. But here we talk about the trees as if the trees are, the tree is a person. The trees danced. So tree is personified. The moon smiled at us. The moon is personified. The car is tired. The car is personified. The next figure of speech is onomatopoeia. Here we use words that describe or imitate sounds. That is for example splash. Splash is what is splash? Water splashes. The sound of water splashing and the word we are using splash. It's both similar. Same way crash. Tick tock. Lub dub. Pop. Popcorn. Pop. So these sounds which imitate Sorry, these words that imitate the sound. Such words are called onomatopoeic words. Now next we have understatement which is presenting a situation as if it is only less important. Now the situation is not less important but we are talking about the situation as if it is less important. For example, when the doctor is going to do an operation or he's going to do something that is going to hurt really bad but the doctor tells you this will hurt a little. Same way if someone is telling that this is going to ruin my whole day after getting shot. You get shot and you all that you could say is oh this might ruin my whole day. So that is an understatement. If you get shot you might get even killed but all that you say is this might ruin my whole day. And imagine somebody telling you it is slightly hot in a desert. You know, it's not slightly hot in a desert. It's definitely extremely hot in a desert. But saying that it is slightly hot is an understatement. Now, you cannot understand whether the statement given is an understatement by simply reading the statement. It depends on the situation. When someone says that this is going to ruin my whole day, uh, maybe after getting uh, wet in the rain, that is not an understatement. But after getting shot, if the person says that this is going to ruin my whole day, then it is an understatement. So, situation is important. Next, we have a hyperbole, which is exactly the opposite of an understatement. Here, we are exaggerating. Something might have happened. Uh, but instead of just telling that this has happened, we say, uh, so this uh, something such of big gravity, a situation of such big uh, extreme gravity has happened. To emphasize a particular point. 
look at the examples i nearly died of laughing you can't die just because you laugh so it is exaggeration you are exaggerating things he sleeps for days just that he sleeps for hours but we exaggerated too much saying he sleeps for days this is the best food in the world now you have not eaten everything in the world but this is the best food in the world is an exaggeration so exaggeration is a hyperbole whereas when you don't give the situation enough importance and you give uh, less importance as if the situation is less important then it is an understatement now next we have transferred epithet here i think it would be better to look at the examples first and then move on to the definition see i had a busy afternoon now was the afternoon busy no the person was busy but instead of telling that i was busy the word busy is given as a description for afternoon busy afternoon same way we had a silent dinner now these people sitting together they were quiet it's not that dinner was quiet okay dinner was not quiet or loud dinner was not quiet the people who sat for the dinner were quiet so instead of telling we were quiet here we are saying that the dinner is quiet it was a careless match again the word careless match is not careless but instead of telling that the players were careless the word careless is given as a description for match so now let's look at the definition a transferred epithet is when an adjective or a phrase a describing word that describes a noun is transferred to describe another word in the same sentence okay you might have understood it now moving on the next figure of speech is epigram epigram is a short statement or even a poem that expresses an idea in a funny or a thought provoking way if you are normally someone who reads books in the beginning of the book you have an epigram a small statement a one liner or a small poem which may convey a, a very deep meaning it could be a very uh, funny way or a, a thought provoking way that this meaning is conveyed okay so uh, look at these examples there are no shortcuts to any place worth going it's very true if you have to reach somewhere you want to go then you should work hard there are no shortcuts in one sentence it looks very simple but there is a very thought provoking message in it same way i can resist everything except temptation experience is the name everybody gives to their mistakes so these uh, one liners i have not included poems but short poems could be also uh, considered as epigrams next we have euphemism which is the use of a polite word instead of an offensive or unpleasant word for example instead of telling uh, that somebody has died in the hospital straight away to the relatives what will the doctor say the doctor might say that uh, this person is in a very critical condition and i don't think i can help it or this person has passed away so words like these Uh, could be used in a more polite way instead of giving it out straight in an unpleasant manner so instead of telling you are an old person we have used the term senior citizen okay same way pass away which means to die economical instead of telling that this is a very cheap dress or this is a very cheap car if you say it is economical the meaning is same but it's more pleasant to say next what we have is pun now pun is a humorous use remember humorous of a word with two or more meanings or using words with the same sound but different meaning okay you only have to remember that when we use a word which has uh, more than one meaning in a situation to make a humor out of it to make it funny to make it comical this is what we always use with our friends even though we do not know that it is called a pun we use it a lot with our friends see a bicycle can't stand on its own because it is too tired now what is tired bicycle has only two tires so it can't stand on its own like a car or an auto now here too tired what is too tired it could also mean that the bicycle is very tired to stand it cannot stand on its own so the word tired too too tired it's used as a pun a horse is a stable animal stable is the word used pun 
writing with a broken pencil is pointless pointless is the pun used here the final figure of speech i have included is irony now irony uh, first i thought of including it in the contrast category but then it's different irony is the use of words to convey the opposite of their literal meaning it's not that we are using two words with opposite meaning in the same sentence no we are giving out a literal meaning in the sentence but actually what we mean is something different okay, okay. Uh, suppose maybe your uh, friend did something very foolish and you are telling him you are very brilliant how clever of you you are not saying that he is clever you are actually being ironic you are actually meaning the opposite of what you said that is irony so irony is the use of words to convey the opposite of their literal meaning a contrast between what is said and what is meant so we have three types of irony verbal irony situational irony and dramatic irony in very simple terms verbal irony is the use of irony in words see how good of you to refuse to help us just like how we told how brilliant of you that you did something so foolish same way how good of you to refuse to help us if you have not helped us it is not good but here it is verbal irony we are using verbal irony in the sentence situational irony is saying something now what we say could be okay in normal situations but in this particular situation it is ironic for example he is a pilot who is afraid of heights a person being afraid of heights doesn't have to be ironic it is okay but what if a pilot is afraid of height that is ironic in this situation it is ironic so that is situational irony and we have dramatic irony dramatic irony is used to create that dramatic effect in literature for example in oedipus rex we have oedipus who hears about the prophecy of killing his father and marrying his mother so he doesn't want the prophecy to come true he escapes the city and what happens he wanted to avoid the prophecy but in the end he ends up killing his father and marrying his mother so that is a dramatic irony i have also included a small point here when we are using irony in order to Uh, ridicule someone in order to mock someone it is called sarcasm now earlier i told you when you tell your friend how brilliant of you to do something so foolish you are actually being sarcastic by using irony okay and with that we come to an end to this video i have included all the important figures of speech is here um i and i have categorized them these are not official categories of figures of speech I have only put them into groups so that it's easier to remember it's easier to memorize and learn so uh, if you have any more points to add about these figures of speech please mention in the comment section also i would look forward to your suggestions in the comment section if you liked the video if you feel that the video was useful to you please like share and subscribe thank you so much for watching